Adorno, Non-Identity and Sexuality by Marcel Stolzer. This chapter explores some of Adorno's scattered remarks on love, on the gender relation between men and women, as well as on homosexuality, and how these relate to modern individuality, subjectivity, and the capitalist mode of production. Its focus is on the modernity of the idea that there are exactly two sexes, understood as two distinct species or essences, and some of the implications and reverberations of this idea. It proceeds by way of arranging, juxtaposing perhaps, a number of related arguments taken from a body of Marxist writing, mostly from the 1970s and 1980s, that seems, if not influenced by, then at least compatible with, Adorno's theorizing. The guiding idea is that strict sexual dimorphism is an aspect or expression of the increasingly genital organization of sexuality on the one hand, and on the other, the sublimation of eros in the service of capitalist real subsumption. Both have been and still are part of the same historical process. Echo, abandon. There is no love that is not an echo. Happiness is what is not exchangeable, not open to complaint. It is a piece of sexual utopia not to be oneself and to love more in the beloved than only her. Love suggests the negation of the ego principle, the negation of the demand for identity. The genital fixation on the I and on the other who is thought of as equally consistent in her or himself, harbors narcissism. When bourgeois love and marriage in their initial stages seem to promise freedom, the exit from servitude in the father's house in the period of big industry, conditions have changed to such an extent that defiance of the family is no more an act of daring than the leisure time relationship with the boyfriend is the gateway to heaven. People adopt a rational, calculating attitude to their own sexuality based on a more casual but all the more effective version of the radical separation of mind and body that underlies the libertinage celebrated by de Sade in the short summer of bourgeois radicalism, the period of the French Revolution. Love and pleasure are very different things, for the sentiments of tenderness correspond to the conditions of humor and convenience, but are in no way dependent on the beauty of a neck or a handsomely curved hip. Dussaud's reasoning, a Cartesianism carried to absurd extremes and indeed turned against its own emancipatory intent is wrong, as Adorno and Horkheimer show. Um, Dussaud's Cartesianism diminishes not only the utopian exuberance of love, but its physical pleasure. The beauty of a neck and the curve of a hip do not act on sexuality as ahistorical, purely natural facts, but as images which comprise all social experience. In this experience, there survives an intention of something other than nature, of love which is not restricted to sex. Not even physical pleasure is actually physis but its actual, namely social content is congealed historical experience, including a moment of intim intimation of utopia, the better state of things projected by the beholder onto the beautifully curved hip. Adorno and Horkheimer may have had in mind here the Shakespeare quote with which Marx concluded the chapter on fetishism in the first value or first volume of Capital. To be good looking is a matter of circumstance, while reading and writing come by nature. Nothing pleased Adorno more than when a friend came to similar insights independently, for he considered it a validation of their correctness. Adorno might have been pleased to read then that Mari, Mari, fuck, Mario Miele, one of the founders of the radical gay, mo gay movement in England and Italy in the 1970s, an advocate of gay communism, came by a different route to the similar conclusion that love is the tendency to annihilate the outworn neurotic and egoistic categories of subject and object. Or the French communist Dominique K 
Karamazov's Demand, published in French in the same year as Miele's Italian text in 1977, that the sexual be dissolved in loving relationships rather than conceptually separated from love. In capitalist society, tenderness and esteem only prepare for or accompany sex and even constitute a form of barter on the terms of X amount of tenderness for Y amount of sexual availability. Abandon the submission which a loving relationship implies, unaccepted because it is in contradiction with a whole way of life, the everyday reality of ubiquitous exchange of equivalents, returns in the form of an exterior domination that is violent, imposed, feared, and desired at the same time. For heightened company, sexual relations are reduced to helping each other towards pleasure, to rendering each other a service, naturally blending the sauce with the indispensable tenderness. Reciprocal masturbation would be the ideal. What escapes them is the possibility of self-abandonment in the other. If it is just a matter of the intensity of pleasure, that there can be, then there can be no doubt that the electronic feeling and sucking machine will win out over masturbation nine times out of 10. On this account, all late bourgeois subjects seem to be dreaming of being so many desades, but due to the reality principle of exchange of equivalents, have to take some limited amount of tenderness into the bargain, an instance of bourgeois society's celebrated capacity to civilize and domesticate the barbarism that it produces in the first place. Karamazov, like Adorno, defends in Marxian language the revolutionary dimension of romanticism against the instrumental logic of left liberal util utilitarianism, which suggests the quantification and accumulation of pleasure and the exchange of equivalent portions of it based on the calculus of mutual benefit. For Adorno, the misshapen bourgeois form of sex Mercury enmeshed with every kind of material interest, marriage as an ennoble compromise, the institutional permitted simulated character of pleasure, its false imminence in an order that cuts it to shape and imparts to it in the very moment of ordaining it a deathly melancholy, creates repugnance, which may even lead ecstasy to withdraw completely into renunciation, rather than sin by realization against its own principle. Although, however, fidelity exacted by society is a means to unfreedom, only through fidelity can freedom achieve insubordination to society's command. Developed capitalism is bad news for romantic love. The integration of society designates subjects more and more exclusively as partial moments in the network of material production, to the effect that the organic composition of man is growing. That which determines subjects as means of production and not as living purposes increases with the proportion of machines to variable capital. The process that begins with the metamorphosis of labor power into a commodity has permeated men through and through and objectified each of their impulses as formally commensurable variations of the exchange relationship. Under the a priori demand for saleability, the living has made itself a something living, a thing, equipment. The ego consciously takes the whole man into its service as a piece of apparatus. In this reorganization, the ego as business manager delegates so much of itself to the ego as business mechanism that it becomes quite abstract, a mere reference point. Self-preservation forfeits itself. Character traits are no longer the subject. Rather, the subject corresponds to them as to his internal object. This is the social pathogen gen pathogenesis of schizophrenia. The severance of character traits, both from their instinctual basis and from the self, which commands them where it former, formerly merely held them together, causes man to pay for his increasing inner organization with increasing disintegration. The consummation of the division of labor within the individual, his radical objectification, leads to his morbid scission. Hence the psychotic character, the anthropological precondition of all totalitarian mass movements. 
Precisely this transition from firm characteristics to push-button behavior patterns is an expression of the rising organic composition of man, and the prompt, unresistant reflexes the subject is entirely extinguished. Adorno holds that love partially withstood throughout the bourgeois age the principle of exchange of equivalents until the present time. The exchange relationship has completely absorbed love. If love was the last immediacy, it has fallen victim to the distance of all the, con all the contracting parties from all others. Love is chilled by the value that the ego places on itself. The more libido is being celebrated in society's shop windows, the less it is really able to undergird actually or actual relationships. The objective dissolution of society is subjectively manifested in the weakening of the erotic urge, no longer able to bind together self-preserving monads. When Casanova in the 18th century called a woman unprejudiced, he meant that no religious convention prevented her from giving herself. Today, the unprejudiced woman is the one who no longer believes in love, who will not be hoodwinked into investing more than she can expect in return. As the arrangements of life no longer allow time for pleasure conscious of itself, replacing it by the performance of physiological functions, de-inhibited sex is itself desexualized. The presence of continuing and ever-renewed exploitation, sexual and otherwise, keeps alive and actualizes the memory of violence and forces the individual to adopt the self-protective, calculating utilitarianism of fair and equal exchange of pleasure units. The reality of love under such social conditions destroys love's own basis, abandon. The experience of pleasure presupposes a limitless readiness to throw oneself away, which is as much beyond women in their fear as men in their arrogance. Not merely the objective possibility, but also the subjective capacity for happiness can only be achieved in freedom. In a typical move, acknowledging the relevance of bodily history, including our prehistory as animals, Adorno introduces this statement with the observation, or rather the claim, that female animals undergo copulation in unfreedom as objects of violence. Women have retained a consciousness of this, particularly among the petty bourgeoisie down to the late industrial era. Society constantly casts women's self-abandoned back into the sacrificial situation from which it freed her. We are thrown back here to the familiar dialectic of bourgeois society. According to its own standards, it makes possible the ability for loving echo and abandon for the first time in human history. But as it denies these possibilities in the same breath, it destroys not only the potential for transcendence that it provides, but even the basis of actual experience of pleasure tout court, no emancipation without that of society. Genitality, nature. Adorno observed apparently in the male environs of an English club that whiskey drinking, cigar smoking, he men despise women because they do not smell of smoke, leather, and shaving cream. In the process of its disintegration, the subject negates everything which is not of its own kind. Um, to these masochistic men, repressed homosexuality, homosexuality presents itself as the only approved form of heterosexuality. He men are not capable of either. It appears that thinking about sexuality has always been fundamentally shaped by the obvious but perplexing way in which the sexual act conf confounds or burdens lust with procreation. It is easy to see that lust would tend to in inhabit the realm of freedom and spirit, procreation that of necessity and matter. This cannot but reverberate with the social fact that the concepts man and woman are similarly charged. The conceptual dich dichotomy of nature and spirit, matter and form, is rooted in the wish to escape nature on which, though, one's life depends. It was formulated in ancient Greece when human domination over nature was not yet complete and irreversible. Spirit is conceived of as pure and identical with itself out of wishful denial of the fact that human life and freedom independent of matter and nature are impossible, i.e. denial of the fact of spirit's non-identity with itself. 
um, I lost my place. This strategy of denial is bolstered by the attempt to think of society and culture as anchored in natural relationships between humans in order to make the former appear as irreversible and indestructible as the latter. In Platonic philosophy, the pleasure principle and the procreational act are radically separated. The latter is part of the material, soulless, non-identical world. In the context of still insecure bourgeois domination, loving women is a disgrace, a procreational necessity imposed by the reality principle. While true love is only homosexual, ped pederastic love, which is not part of the banal procreation of matter. That men could have non-procreational sex with women did not seem to occur to Plato. The reduction of women to instruments of procreation and thus their distance from spirit is silently presupposed in this train of thought. Aristotle, who is more prepared to acknowledge that culture and society need to be mediated with nature, is well disposed towards heterosexuality. This seems to reflect increased confidence in culture's domination of nature. Culture, spirit, and men is now confident enough to admit its dependence on nature, matter, and women. Kral writes that only in the 19th century did the equation of truth with, with identity, the notion of spirit's self-identity as its purity from matter, lose its grip on philosophy. Developed bourgeois society had grown so confident of its domination of nature that it found it safe now to admit in political economy that human existence can only be produced in mediation with nature. Paulinian Christianity offered an alternative way of revising the Platonic con conception. Flesh is sinful matter opposed to God's pure identity in his trinity. The sexual act is mere duty, a concession to natural necessity that must not provide pleasure. Non-procreational sex sexuality, i.e. sex for pleasure, is forbidden. In the Christian framework, differing from the Platonic, only God and Jesus, God's Son, are entitled to spiritualized homosexual as well as pederastic incestuous embrace in love, not to mention the Holy Spirit who completes the Trinity. Through the reorientation, all eroticism turns in Europe into neurosis, repressed homosexuality. Homosexuality is repressed because it is thought to be pure bliss and is therefore illicit. We mortal sinners don't deserve it. The crucial contribution of homosexuality to human civilization lies in its unequivocal assertion of the purposelessness of sexuality. In spite of knowing, it seems to recapture some of the innocence or naivete that must have reigned in human sexuality before humans discovered that there was a causal relationship between intercourse and pregnancy. Adorno writes that the homosexual becomes the port portent of a sexuality alienated from its proper purpose. To alienate sexuality from its alleged purpose, procreation, is, however, the whole point of its emancipation, and being its portent is what gives homosexuality such a prominent place um, in the debates and struggles about sexuality's liberation and alienation. If, however, the emancipation of sexuality can only mean its alienation from what society claims is its purpose, gender dimorph dimorphism, too, loses in the process its real basis. Women as an alleged natural being is a product of history, which denatu denaturizes her. Male logic, a specific instance of what Adorno describes as identity logic, refers to women only as represent representatives of a species that is alleged to represent nature. Therewith, it denies the naturalness of any particular woman which consists to the extent that meaningful use of the term naturalness is possible at all in her individuality, namely any individual's identity against his or her identification, as Adorno would later put it in negative dialectic. In Minima Moralia, he writes, the female character and the ideal of femi femininity on which it is modeled are products of masculine society. The female character is a negative imprint of domination. 
but therefore equally bad. Whatever is in the context of bourgeois delusion called nature is merely the scar of social mutilation. What passes for nature in civilization is, by its very substance, furthest from all nature. Femininity is already the effect of the whip. Glorification of the feminine character implies the humiliation of all who bear it. Oscar Wilde famously remarked on the soul of man under socialism that the only thing that one really knows about human nature is that it changes. It is in the nature of humans to change their own nature. We are nature naturans, active nature, as much as nat natura naturata, nature as created. In the 19th century context, the idea was widespread that what, what makes human beings human is that they have begun to play with their natural conditions, whether one is talking about changing the course of a river or the sexual use of an orifice not naturally intended for the purpose. In the modernist context, natural does not mean unchangeable, but on the contrary, the natural may be what humans can and ought to change and what they already are in the process of changing. This needs to be kept in mind when reading, for example, Marx's remark in the 1844 manuscripts that the most natural relationship between man and woman is the relationship between man and woman. Oh, fuck. I read that wrong. This needs to be kept in mind when reading, for example, Marx's remark in the 1844 manuscripts that the most natural relationship between man and man is the relationship between man and woman. Marx explains that the relationship of man to woman reveals in a sensuous form, reduced to an observable fact, the extent to which the human essence has become nature for man, or nature has become the human essence for man. It is possible to judge from this relationship the entire level of development from mankind. It follows from the character of this relationship how far man ha as a species being, as man, has become himself and grasped himself. It demonstrates the extent to which man's natural behavior has become human, or the extent to which his human essence has become a natural essence for him. The extent to which his human nature has become nature for him. Marx differentiates here between the natural state of human nature, which is a quasi-pre-civilizational starting point, and the human nature or human essence that becomes in the process of civilization. He presents the gender relation as its touchstone. This makes clear that the notion that man ought to return to an original human nature is nothing but reactionary. Human nature, the humane, ought to become the nature of the human world, but it exists as yet only as potentiality and in the pores and interstices of an inhuman reality. The contemporary form of its inhumanity can, to a large extent, be captured with the concept of the capitalist mode of production. The following remark on the modern concept of nature made by Marx in an 1862 letter to Engels is important here. It is remarkable how Darwin recognizes among beasts and plants his English society with its divisions of labor, competition, opening up of new markets, inventions, and the Malthusian struggle for existence. Hobbes's Bellum Omnium Contra Omnis, in Darwin, the animal kingdom figures as civil society. Darwin reads society into nature, not the other way around. Gilbert Hurt wrote that it has been one of Darwin's basic assumptions that sexual behavior served the purposes of reproduction and selective fitness of individuals in evolution. He stresses that this emphasis on dimorphism reveals a deeper stress on reproduction as a paradigm of science and society. The emphasis on the concept of reproduction points to the predominant role of political economy for 19th century bourgeois thought. Theorists who followed Darwin's consistent emphasis on reproduction typically viewed sexual selection as an innate and natural property of our own species as well. This view included the idea that male and female are innate structures in all forms of life, including human beings, and that heterosexuality is the teleologically necessary and highest form of sexual evolution. 
even the sex life of flowers was imagined in heterosexual terms. But the critique of the naturalization of heterosexuality must avoid the naturalization of any alternative trajectory. Sartre argued in Being and Nothingness that the conception of libido in need of release is based on a category mistake about human action. Connell paraphrased Sartre's argument as follows. We act sexually, we become sexual, but we are not constituted from the start as sexual beings. We are not driven and we cannot act so as to liberate what is in process of being constituted. The goal of radical politics, therefore, cannot be the liberation of sexuality from social constraint. We can no more liberate libido than we can liberate the square root of minus one. There's no thing there to liberate. Sexuality cannot be liberated. Only individuals can liberate themselves from oppression. Connell stresses that such liberation would have to be revolutionary, literally, not metaphorically. It requires the overthrow of institutions, it depends on mass actions, and it points to, to a profoundly altered social order. That a real revolution is involved was perfectly clear to women's liberation and gay liberation activists and theorists around 1970, and is, and is exactly what has been lost in the evolution of theory ever since. The early formulas of sexual liberation, which drew their model of power and revolution from a bookish Marxism, were implausible, but they had a sound understanding of the depth of change involved. Adorno discussed the connection between the sublimation, integration, and genitalization of sexuality in his essay on sexual taboos. Bourgeois society coped with the threat posed by the proletariat by integrating it, and likewise it integrated the sexes, which it institutionalized, domesticated, neutralized, and tolerated. Whatever could not be integrated, the actual spiciness of sex remains under taboo. Genital sexuality as the dominant form of sexuality is, according to Freud, the result of integration. This is an historically specific, impoverished, and reduced synthesis of the ensemble of partial libidos and causes the desexualization of sexuality when it makes a taboo, in turn, of the partial drives. In traditional society, taboos were directed at both the partial drives and genital sexuality. In the context of formal freedom, taboos take different forms. The most efficient taboo comes in the shape of liberalization. Sexuality is usurped by an ideal of naturalness and in a culture of wholesome outdoor living is reduced as much as possible to pure genitality. The liberation in the name of naturalness, nudism is a case in point, fights back any refinement. Adorno uses the French raffinement, raffinement, in which the partial drives would have their place. The desublimation of the partial drives by the degenitalization of sexuality is also central to Mario Miele's concept of gay communism. Miele argued against both the identities of hetero and homosexuality, and also dismiss, dismissed bisexuality as nothing more than a rather poor conceptual compromise between those. If both homo and heterosexuality are negations of some aspects of life, gayness is the negation of the negation. Miele draws the parallel to communism as the negation of that automatic monster, capital. The political aim of gay communism in, is general gayness, whereby the word flips back into its older and broader meaning, happiness. Gay communism includes new gay relations between women and, women, women and men, different from the traditional couple. The object of the revolutionary struggle of homosexuals is not that of winning social tolerance for gays, but rather the liberation of the homoerotic desire in every human being. The existence of this desire has most famously been stated by Freud. In all of us throughout life, the libido normally oscillates between male and female objects. Repressed homosexual desire is still present, converted in many different occasions in which physical contact between members of the same sex is permitted, such as in sport, or where the symbolic more than the actual phallus is celebrated 
patriotism and drunkenness, business partnerships, political rackets, gangs, and the rock star, uh, the rock star cult, religion, a universal obsessional neurosis of humanity, partly to the extent that godfather figures are being revered, a result of the child's desire for the father. Like the sons of Freud's mystical primitive father who, after uniting in a homosexual bond, find the strength to kill him, but are then overtaken by remorse and establish in memory and substitution for the father, the totem, the phallic fetish, so the homosexuals who meet in liberation groups are largely powerless against the attack from the superego that immediately assails them and finds themselves forced to establish in their midst leaders, phallic and charismatic figures who command them, personifying the authority of the superego that binds every individual member of the group with a sense of guilt. Miele's reworking of Freud's myth applies to all revolutionary and leftist groups, protect uh, practically all of which consist mostly of men, unless they consist solely of women, drawn together by some obscure quasi-platonic desire to read, for example, and habitually to kill and reinvent fathers, phallic and charismatic figures. The case for revolutionary desublimation is somewhat complicated by the discovery of repressive desublimation, by way of which capital enables the unconscious to emerge in alienated forms in order to subsume it. Miele points to voyeurism as one of the most profitable perversions for capital. Perversion is sold both wholesale and retail. It is studied, classified, valued, marketed, accepted, discussed. It becomes culture, science, printed paper, money. If for millennia, therefore, societies have repressed the so-called perverse components of eros in order to sublimate them in labor, the present system liberalizes these perversions with a view to their further exploitation in the economic sphere. According to Miele, perversions must be repressed in order to become liberalized and fetishized into marketable sexual consumer products and livable identities. Tweedledum, Tweedledee. Freedom would, freedom would be not to choose between black and white, but to abjure such prescribed choices, Adorno writes. Is there a case for arguing that one could abjure the prescribed choice between being male and female, having man and woman emerged in history, or have man and woman emerged in history, and can they be expected to disappear too? The French novelist and theorist Monique Wittig made the probably most powerful claim in that direction, pointing for this purpose to Marx's writing, where dialectical categories, such as the one and the other, master and slave, were not there to stay and had nothing metaphysical or essential about them, but had to be read and understood in historical terms. Thus, the categories which are today called so solemnly categories of difference were for Marx categories of social conflicts, which throughout the class struggle were supposed to destroy each other. Failure to question the categories man and woman impedes the fight for their disappearance. The aim of feminism is to abolish the class men, thus simultaneously abolishing the class women, for there are no slaves without masters. In Wittig's writings, lesbians, whether they know it or not, are beyond the category of sex, just as the proletariat in Marx's conception is beyond the category of class. Both mean the negation of a negative existence. The rise of evangelical religion, enlightenment political theory, the development of new sorts of public spaces in the 18th century, Lockean ideas of marriage as a contract, the cataclysmic possibilities for social change wrought by the French Revolution, post-revolutionary conservatism, post-revolutionary fem feminism, the factory system with its restructuring of the, of the sexual division of labor, the rise of a free market economy in services or commodities, the birth, of, the birth of classes, singly or in combination, none of these things caused the making of a new sexed body. Instead, the remaking of the body is itself intrinsic to each of these developments. Authors from different backgrounds and persuasions agree that in the late 18th century, human sexual nature changed. In the words of Virginia Woolf, quoted in Le Coeur in 1992, 
It was argued that not, not only were the sexes different, but they were different in every conceivable aspect of body and soul. Sexual difference was now meant to be a difference in kind, not degree. It is in this context that the discourse on sexual dimorphism begins to shape social theory. Still in the Renaissance context, context no true deep essential sex differentiated cultural man from woman. The period that developed claims of the sort that black people have stronger, coarser nerves than Europeans because they have smaller brains and that these facts explain the inferiority of their culture also came up with the notion that the uterus naturally disposes women toward domesticity. Historically, differentiations of gender preceded differentiations of sex. In pre 18th century discourses, the body was far less fixed and far less constrained by categories of bio biological difference than thereafter. In terms of the millennial tradition traditions of Western medicine, genitals came to matter as the marks of sexual opposition only last week. Only the 18th century developed the strategy to escape to supposed biological substrata. The teachings of cosmology had no need for biology. The advantage of the older discourse was, though, that it believed that apart from pleasure, nothing of mortal kind comes into existence. A strange case of wishful thinking. This aphorism, quoted in Lacour in 1992, illustrates the pre-enlightenment assumption that female orgasm was as necessary for successful conception as the male one. Thanks to this lack of scientific accuracy, subsequently amended by modern medicine, female sexual pleasure still had a place in the logical order of things, although sexuality was, theoretically at least, already subsumed to the notion that its purpose is to produce offspring. The interpretation of human bodies, according to precisely two categories, neither more nor less than two, is logically an outcome of reducing the perception of erogenous zones of the body to those that are functional to reproductive activity. The sexual responsiveness of body areas that are irrelevant for reproduction is denied and may become taboo. These desexualized areas are thus made irrelevant to the sexual classification of bodies too. The concept of the two sexes, the one sex and the other sex, is therefore an effect of heterosexuality as a, as a societal norm. In European societies before the modern era, sexuality seems to have been less clearly dichotomized into hetero and homosexuality. Everybody was assumed, or rather suspected, to perform, to perform homosexual as well as heterosexual acts the former being variously persecuted and punished. Since the 19th century, however, homosexual acts are automatically considered to be expressive of the homosexual nature of the actor, who is no longer considered to be per perpetrating sinful homosexual, or rather sodomite acts, but who is a homosexual, that is, a member of a particular category of human species. The discourse moves from whether or how homosexual acts need to be punished to whether the homosexual as such, as a different sort of species, is persecuted, psychiatrized, or tolerated. Just as race is assumed to determine automatically and spontaneously the racialized individual, sex is understood as specific and irreducible urgency. Sex and race are extra historical essences underlying a species essence. Whatever the meaning of sex may once have been, in modern society, sex, like race, becomes essence. As Connell writes, the abolition of the linking of fields of social practice th to the reproductive division would mean that sexual difference would be simply a complementary function in reproduction, not a cosmic division or a social fate. There would be no reason for this to structure, uh, to structure emotional relationships. So the categories heterosexual and homosexual would become insignificant. What Ernest Renan claimed for nationality is true also for the imposition of dic dichotomous sex. It has to appear as a daily plebiscite, but simultaneously as something one has always been, something one has actively forgotten to have become and in how cruel a way one has become so. 
the violent history of the shaping of the object no longer appears with that object. Hence, sex is the reality e effect of a violent process that is concealed by that very effect. In other words, what Adorno, following Marx, would have called a fetish. In a society based on separation and isolation of atomized individuals who are unhappily chained together only on the basis of a set of neurotic projections, nation, religion, etc., as well as the practices and institutions that undergird them, it seems unsurprising that Tweedledee will occasionally, perhaps increasingly, have sex without the involvement of Tweedledum, or even of another Tweedledee. Although this tendency must be expected within the dialectic of bourgeois society, it makes its defenders and therapists turn to their Adam Smith problem. Masturbation threatens the healthy measure of neurosis that we call social cohesion. It has been vilified by bourgeois society as an antisocial form of subject-object identity that counters heterosexuality and bypasses or makes irrelevant the holy cow of sexual dimorphism. The power of the taboo on the solitary vice can be read from how strongly it, it features even in the thinking of bourgeois society's most radical progressives. Richard Carlyle, editor of Tom Paine's works and of the Red Republican, Unleashed in Every Woman's Book or What is Love, etc., a sustained attack on conventional sexual morality, advocating birth control and temples of Venus for the controlled, healthy, extramarital satisfaction of female desire. In doing so, he was, according to Lacour, motivated by promoting the natural and healthy com commerce between the sexes, which also led him to a particularly shrill rejection of masturbation. His concern was a moral one. The solitary vice is a vice precisely because it is solitary. The debate over masturbation that raged from the 18th century on might therefore be understood as part of the more general debate about the unleashing of desire in a commercial economy and about the possibilities of human community in these circumstances. Lacour refers to this as a sexual version of the classic Adam Smith problem, without actually challenging the principles of the capitalist mode of production, which manifestly produces egoistic, calculating, monadic individuals. How can I make sure that the degree of community necessary for its functioning reproduces itself spontaneously and continuously, that is, without an overtly obesion, leviathan-type state? It's Hobbesian, not Obesian, Hobbesian, Leviathan-type state. <laughs> this question, which haunted Smith, has never lost anything of its near-universal grip on liberal thought in the widest sense of the word. <clears throat> A parallel case is the discourse on prostitution, which, like masturbation, was declared to be a core antisocial evil for the first time in the 19th century. The modern obsession with campaigning against prostitution is grounded in seeing it as a confusion between the dangerously asocial, asocial world of commercial exchange and the healthy social world of married love. Lacour draws a surprising parallel here between the 19th century discourse on prostitution and the 12th century papal campaign against usury, which subsequently reemerged in the various forms of modern anti-Semitism, an early response to a nascent market economy. The church hierarchy, basing itself on Thomist philosophy, denounced the usurious charging of interest because nothing real is gained by it. In Thomist Catholicism, the usurer's capital is illeg illegitimate because, because it is generated in the sphere of circulation only. It does not come from productive, which in this context means, first of all, agricultural, labor. Lacour points out that the same pattern of argument is directed in the 19th century against prostitution. Money earned from prostitution is illeg illegitimate money since nothing is produced. Like usury, prostitution is pure exchange. Like homosexuality, it is unproductive and purposeless. The concern with social cohesion and a clean separation of the sphere of exchange from that of love, privacy, etc., collides in the case of prostitution with the tendency of commodity relations to really subsume all aspects of life. 
Bourgeois society cannot consistently maintain that value production is the only value it respects. It has to try to maintain values, family life, heterosexual love, parental affection, etc., that are undermined by the production of value. Lacour does not make any such references here, nor does he develop the theoretical implications of what he, he is describing but his attempt to think anti-Semitism and sexuality together within the framework of a critique of the concept of production resonates with the thrust of dialectic of enlightenment. Substance Subsumption Adorno quotes in negative dialectic a passage from Hegel's oh, fuck off, Rex philosophy, in <laughs> which Hegel gives eloquent expression to one of the fundamental paradoxes at the core of the concept of the modern state. It is downright essential that, although the constitution originated in time, it not be viewed as a product, for it is that, rather, which is flatly in and, and for itself, and is therefore to be considered divine and enduring, and above the sphere of that which is produced. Adorno points out that what Hegel is describing here is affirmatively what Marx later would describe critically as fetishism. Hegel's observation that the state, represented here pars pro toto by its constitution, must appear as if it was not the artifact that everybody knows it to be, reappears in many disguises in many different but related discourses. It is behind Renan's famous assertion that one has to have forgotten the many cruelties that were necessary for the nation, the great peacemaker that is so central to bourgeois political thought, to be built. Or else, in Simone de Beauvoir's assertion that being a woman means becoming what one supposedly has been all along. When Hegel pointed to the daily reading of a particular newspaper as one of the reiterative acts that produce what looks like it has always been there, the same can be said of Renan's daily plebiscites and Butler's daily acts of performative reiteration that produce the real illusion of sex. Marx's concept of fetishism is the tool to unpack all of the above. It should be pointed out, however, that race and sex implications do not willfully need to be inferred in the concept. They have been present there all along. The German philologi phil phil philologist uh, F. Max Müller complained in a lecture of 1878 that the very theory of fetishism was at the time so widely debated in a whole range of discourses that it had itself become a kind of scientific fetish. Marx reflected the fetishism of fetishism in his own adoption of the concept. The word itself, related in similar meaning to artifact, something that has been made, a product, had in the Middle Ages referred to popular talismans, which were heretical and illegal devices. <clears throat> the early Portuguese explorers and colonialists employed the term to describe the charms worn by people encountered on the West African coast, identifying the undesirable habits of savages at home and in the colonies by referring to them with the same word. In a text from 1704, a Dutch West Indies official, Willem Bosman, or hold on, Bosman, reported that colonial subjects had massacred hogs after a hog had eaten a snake, which happened to be the chief fetish of the respective region. This enlightened gentleman disapproved strongly of such uneconomic behavior, by which the real commercial value of things is obscured by sentimental respect of certain animals. By the middle of the 19th century, fetishism had become increasingly racialized and denoted, in the words of the anthropologist Edward B. Tyler, the one-sided logic of the barbarian. But it did not escape bourgeois scholarship that there was fetishism at home, too. Tyler himself pointed to collecting scarce postage stamps or queer walking sticks as the Englishman's own fetish. The point is, however, that European fetishes were thought of as eccentricities or anachronistic superstitions, whereas the mind of the savage was constituted by fetishism. In 1888, the French psychologist Alfred Binet introduced the concept of fetishism into the discourse on sexuality. 
Binet referred to degenerates who experienced intense genital excitation from the contemplation of certain objects which would leave any normal person completely unaffected. Thus, throughout its evolution from the heretic via the savage to the sexual pervert, the concept of fetishism serves bourgeois society, whether emerging or established, to denote what it thinks it most definitely is not. The rhetorical power of Marx's adoption of the term lies in its ironic inversion. In Marx, fetishism is not the exception or the anachronism, but the truth and the essence of modern bourgeois society. The half-developed form of Marx's concept, clearly revealing its origins, is evident in an article from October 1842 in which Marx ridicules a debate in the Rhenish Diet on a law concerning the theft of wood, conducted blatantly in the interest of the aristocratic owners of the forests. Marx argues that the social and legal rights of human beings are sacrificed to the wooden idols. In his conclusions, he turns the concept of the fetish against the prov prov provincial assembly, explicitly drawing on the colonial implications of the concept. The savages of Cuba held gold to be the fetish of the Spaniards. They held a celebration in its honors and then dumped it into the sea. Had the savages of Cuba attended the meeting of the Rhenish provincial estates, would they not have held the wood to be the fetish of the Rhinelanders? But they would have gathered from the following meeting that the Rhinelandish fetishism is to the service of animals, and the savages of Cuba would have dumped the rabbits into the sea in order to save the humans. One commodity can stand in for other commodities only because it is a product of labor. The equivalent form represents the abstract labor that has gone into it. The product of concrete labor is thereby reduced to being the form of appearance of a quantity of abstract labor, which assumes a somewhat higher form of realness. The abstraction becomes the essence, or the soul, of the concrete from which it has been abstracted in the first place. It is on the basis of this essentialism, as it were, not Marx's term, that despite its buttoned-up appearance, the linen recognizes in the coat a splendid kindred soul, the soul of value. Marx draws another parallel. A king is a king only because other men stand in relation of subjects to him. They, on the other hand, imagine that they are subjects because he is king. King is a social relation. Actors say the king is always played by the others. King is not the being, essence, of the person who is king, but it is the set of effects that constitute the relations between the king and the subjects. The normal behavior of loyal subjects is that they reify or essentialize the kingness of the king and behave as if the king's kingness was the cause of their subjectness. Fetishism means, among other things, that a relational category is transfigured into an essential category. Something that really consists in relations between people is presented as, and to some extent really becomes, an essential, intrinsic, and spontaneous characteristic of a thing, which in turn becomes the mere carrier of that essence. At the very moment in history when the execution of the French king opened the door to a society of equals, human groups came to be seen as formed by an irreversible diktat of nature, which made groups into fetishes, frozen into some intrinsic form of being, which was said to possess immutable homogeneous qualities. The traditional idea of the one great society of man, subject to and contrasted with God, was replaced by the scientific conception of many different groups, scattered through time and space. Modern society created the individual as freed from estate and hierarchy, as well as from the means of subsistence, and placed him and her into the chains of somatogenetic determinism. This argument developed, developed by Colette Guillaumin with both race and sex in mind can help to ground historically the more generic critique of essentialism and identity. Contemporary concepts of sexual, cultural, racial, ethnic, national, or whatever such identity bear their 18th century mark in assuming that social groups have an intrinsic essence and relate to other such groups only secondarily and accidentally, like Le Lebnizian monads. 
The ensemble of social relations is external to the essence of the group. Histi history is outside essence, essence outside history. Whereas black skin color had initially merely been the arbitrary sign of a particular social position, slavery. It was subsequently reinterpreted as the cause of that social relation. Initially, people in the areas where slaves could be made comfortably and with a healthy profit just happened to be black. Later, it appeared that they were slaves because they were black, at which point their black skin stood in for their racial essence, which also colored their souls. In what Guillaumin calls endogenous determinism, the mark is more than just an arbitrary mark. It is an expression of the nature of the object. A particular nature is directly productive of a social practice and of social relations. Essence produces appearance without mediation and outside inflection. It is spontaneous nature. A social group is imagined to possess an invariant substance that is handed down through the generations. This essentialism or endodeterminism is not an accidental case of false consciousness. The point is that the individual is really made into a mere example of a category, a class, imagined as a substantial entity possessing an essence that seems to determine spontaneously from its own the individual's inherent finality. The essence of the class is also the essence or identity of all that fall into it, although at the same time it never is. The members of a modern race are an undifferentiated mass, an agglomeration of contemporaries juxtaposed in space, or as journalists and politicians hunting immigrants love to put it, drops in an enormous tidal wave. All drops in a tidal wave are identical, and in their reducibility to a common abstract essence, water, race, they resemble the mass accumulation of commodities that constitutes capital. The monadic members of a race share their racial essence, just like the modern masses of commodities share the quality of being carriers of value, the soul of the coat in Marx's image. Furthermore, the racialized individual is characterized by the same precarious dialectic between identity, racial essence, obnoxious, and difference, individual appearance, sometimes acceptable or at least useful. This is what makes racism modern, a product typical of democratic and individualist society. Guillaumin argues that woman refers to just such a class or category. Monique Wittig writes in the same spirit that while the declaration of color has come to be considered discriminatory, the declaration of sex still goes unchallenged. One has widely stopped calling certain people Negroes, but one continues calling certain people women. Likewise, Connell writes, while homosexual behavior of some kind may be universal, this does not automatically entail the existence of self-identified or publicly labeled homosexuals. The homosexual represents the modern definition of a new type of adult male. This argument reflects Foucault's observation that, whereas sodomy had been a category of forbidden acts perpetrated by any human being as a sin that would or would not lead, that person to the stake. The modern homosexual is a species that needs special treatment involving experts ranging from social workers and psychiatrists to the concentration camp warden. The homosexual act counts not as an occasional sin, but as expressive of the compulsive nature, the identity of the actor. The replacement of essence for sin may lead to more lenient or harsher treatment. Foucault and Miele make virtually the same case that sex is an effect of social relations and practices, which come to be treated as an essence, a natural transhistorical drive or urge. The fetishistic concept of sexuality lies at the pivot of the transformation of the family and the modern normalizing state and its racist practices. Within one and the same process, the automatic monster, i.e. capitals, Subsumption of the entire human life process normalizes sexuality into sexual identities. Sameness. A fetishistic process of negation and reduction. The division of the social world into apparently autonomous spheres seems particularly crucial to this process. The division of the public and domestic spheres itself a product of the expansion of marketized social relations 
and the liberal state has superimposed these increasingly polarized functions on traditional traditional notions of gender relations. The critique of essence as identity and its underlying link to the historic process of real subsumption, fundamental to otherwise rather different intellectual traditions, lies at the bottom also of Horkheimer's early critique of sociology of knowledge, as in Mannheim, which was a defining element in his formulation of the framework of critical theory. Marx correctly sought to do away with the conviction that there is some essence of being which pervades all epochs and societies and lends them, lends them their meaning. It was precisely this element of Hegelian philosophy that appeared to him to be an idealist delusion. Only human beings themselves, not the essence of humanity, but the real human beings in a definite historical moment, dependent upon each other and upon outer and inner nature, are the acting and suffering subjects of history. But the irrational ends of bourgeois society could hardly have been stabilized by other than effective irrational means. Men, things. Sexuality reduced to a crystallized social and intellectual essence achieves the final spoliation of everyday life, and that is its contribution to terrorism. If men no longer had to equate themselves with things, they would neither they would need neither a thing like superstructure nor an inv an invariant picture of themselves after the model of things. The reduction of human labor to the abstract universal concept, concept of average working hours is fundamentally akin to the principle of identification. It makes non-identical individuals and performances become incommensurable and identical. Just as the concrete types of human labor are dissolved into abstract human labor as the creator of value, so also all concrete peculiar peculiarities which distinguish one representative of the genus Homo sapiens from another, dissolve into the abstraction of man in general, man as a legal subject. In compensation for having become slavishly dependent, the subject acquires under modern conditions a rare gift. In Pashikani's words, a will juridically constituted which makes him absolutely free and equal to other owners of commodities like himself. Poor bourgeois subject, you think it unfair that not all individuals own equal number of slaves, factories, wives, acres, iPods, etc. Don't despair, there is consolation. Everyone possesses his own body as the free tool of his will, as Ficht, expanding on Locke's conception of property, pointed out. Ficht's notion that I own my own body as a tool also resonates with Descartes' concept of the thinking subject as radically separate from his or her body. And the fact that the owner of the tool can change this tool, make it fit better any given purpose or order, brings us back to de Beauvoir's central problem of the becoming of the subject, the problem of the human potential to transcend and reinvent or rearticulate the body, and the debate around Wittig, Butler, and others that sprung from it. Pashikanis describes a specific legal fetishism that complements commodity fetishism. He writes that the social relation of production, on the one hand, appear as relations between things, and on the other, as relations between the wills of autonomous entities equal to each other of legal subjects. While this is merely a restatement of the classic problem of free will and determination in sociological language, agency, and structure, Pashikanis points to the specifically capitalist form of what he calls the legal subject. Legal subjectivity in the modern bourgeois sense of the word is abstracted from every concrete claim, whereas in the feudal context, every right was a privilege. Only in commodity production does the general capacity to possess a right become distinguished from concrete legal claims. Only the continual reshuffling of values in the market creates the idea of a fixed bearer of such rights. The abstraction from concrete claims is possible only through the everyday experience that the commodity owner changes roles instantaneously from claimant to debtor. The seller of a commodity, even if it is only labor power, will be the buyer of another commodity in the next instant. The worker who spent the day in the factory may command the services of another wage worker in the evening. 
This modern fluidity in the concrete makes possible and engenders the idea of the abstract, fixed, unalienable subject as the bearer of every imaginable legal claim. It is because relationships are fluid that they are frozen solid, and only because of their frozenness, their buttoned-up appearance, that they can make a claim to equality, their universal soul. The idea of the worth and in principle equal worth of the personality has a long history. It made the transition from Stoic philosophy to being employed by Roman jurists, went from there to the dogma of the Christian church, and thence to the doctrine of natural law. But regardless of the various forms this idea may have, may have assumed, it expresses nothing but the fact that, as soon as the products of labor are exchanged as commodities, the different concrete types of socially useful labor are deduced to labor in the abstract. In all other relations, people's dissim dissimilarity, sexual or class determined, is so conspicuously apparent in the course of history that one is amazed by the fact that, before Marx, no one had looked into the historical causes which produced this bias of natural law. For if, over the centuries, human thinking has returned with such persistence to the proposition that people are equal, and has elaborated this proposition in a thousand variations, then there must have been some objective reality behind it. This reality is the exchange of commodities, for millennia an affair that barely affected most people, but that in the modern period has come to constitute all of human society. But man is not only what he was and is, but equally what he can come to be. We cannot say what man is. Man today drags along with him as his social heritage the, mut the mutilations inflicted upon him over thousands of years. To decipher the human essence by the way it is now would sabotage its possibility. The reasonable form of society in which men no longer have to equate themselves with things will bring about that other modernity in which identity will be freed from the ice of identification. <clears throat> the remnants of a division of labor which the radical curtailment of working hours might leave in society will lose the horror of shaping the individuals throughout. In the SAS form, Adorno referred to the leisure of the childlike person as a defining feature of the essay probably Adorno's most characteristic form of writing. Life in a reasonable society will be more like an essay than a treatise and will accommodate plenty of childlike leisure. However, as always, and an extra bit more clear-sighted than fellow theorists like Marcuse or Benjamin, Adorno stops short of endorsing even the idea of the leisure, leisure of the childlike person. In the crucial section 1, 150 of Minima Moralia, Adorno warns that the advocacy of a readmission of the partial drives an element of becoming childlike is a crucial part of modernity as it is, and while the pluralism of the partial drives, as represented in Baudelaire's writings, which for Ador Adorno illustrate this issue, clearly has his sympathies, he warns that their embrace must not mean regression. The idea of modernity, according to Baudelaire, contains the false promise that the self-destruction of the monism of bourgeois reason was modernity's hope. It produces, though merely pluralism, as a many-colored feta morgana responding to the partial drives of the child. Likewise, the cult of sensation of immediate perception of the allegedly new, including the craving for headlines and other addictions, is merely a helpless response to the fact that capitalist modernity means monotony, identity, and neurotic compulsive repetition more than anything else. It affects the decomposition of the subject and drains all firmness from characters. Ego weakness, faithlessness, and pathic subservience to situations, though, will not beat the system. Two complementary and indirectly related explanations for the emergence of the modern concept of sexual binar binarism are evident. One, more macro as it were, sees it as an effect reflection or expression of the public-private divide, that is, the carving up of the social world into supposedly but never actually independent spheres. The other, more micro as an effect, reflection or expression of the imposition of near-exclusive genital sexuality, which in turn is part of the larger disciplining effort that created the modern subject. The domestication of the partial drives in the form of genital organization of sexuality, capital's precarious insurance policy against its subjects, regression into childlike leisure,
created the modern form of the idea that there are exactly two sexes, men and women, and that being one or the other organizes and shapes every aspect of any individual human being. The traje trajectory to a reasonable form of society, or rather a state of things after and beyond the fetishes of society, state, and, indivi and individual, would have to include the critique of the genital organization of sexuality. The importance of homosexuality in this context is that it tends to be less strictly genital genitally organized for the obvious reason that it is not subordinated to what counts for society as the functional purpose of sexuality, procreation, although it can still, of course, be equally subordinated to social reproduction in a wider sense, i.e. beyond the reproduction of working bodies, hence legal ideological phenomena such as gay marriage, etc. All aspects of modern bourgeois subjectivity are intrinsic aspects of one ensemble of social relations, the capitalist mode of production that can only be overcome as an ensemble. The society of identity has a belly, as it is still the old monster, the, Le the Leviathan, in different clothes. It can always find reasons why some particular element of non-identity needs to be devoured. To the same extent to which the normal, banal, cool racism that is implicit in the nation form does every now and again turn hot, the heterosexual world of two sexes may occasionally indulge in some gay bashing. However, respectable homosexuality as an identity may have become. Because the non-identical is never completely accommodated in any identity, neither the homosexual nor the heterosexual is completely safe from rushes of gayness, the dissolution of sexuality, just like no historical compromise and social democratic national regime can ever completely eradicate rushes of proletarianness, the dissolution of class. All aspects of the capitalist regime remain precarious. The good news is that there is room for anti-politics everywhere, always.